Uh, hello there. Uh, in this video, we're going to be having a look at the source code for a CodeBots application. And it's going to give you an overview of the primary concepts which you need to be familiar with in order to understand the structure of your code and develop efficiently with CodeBots. So keep in mind that you have complete ownership of all the code that the CodeBots have written. And all of the code is customizable and ready for use, whether it be for commercial or non-commercial purposes. Right, so to introduce CodeBots, CodeBots is a development tool designed to make software companies and developers faster. And now that we have built our application with CodeBots, let's go through all of the important pieces of the source code which have been created. Right, so here we are currently on the GitLab page, so we can have a look at all of the major components of our application. Um, now that we have built our application with CodeBots, let's go through all of the important pieces of the source code which have been created. We are currently on the GitLab page, so we can have a look at all of the major components of our application. So the code for our application is broken down into the client side, server side, and the test target. As the names might suggest, the client side folder contains all of the code used to render the client and is written in React. The server side folder contains all of the code used to implement the server functionality and is written in C sharp and uses .NET. And the test target contains all of the tests for our application. There is also a shortcuts folder, which contains scripts which you can use to quickly start your application yep, using Linux, Mac, or Windows. Finally, the application also has the models folder, which contains all of the information you entered when generating your application. Modifying the models folder doesn't change anything in the application, so you shouldn't need to make any changes here. Now, we're gonna go into the readme file and have a look around. The bot written readme contains information about all of the options in the application. However, this can be modified to fit your purposes at any time. The file starts with a quick intro and a link to the release notes for the most recent release of C Sharp Bot. After that, we have our table of contents and then the getting started section. Uh, so now we are going to talk about how you can customize the code that was written by the bot. Your application comes with something called protected regions. And these protected regions are places where you can edit the bot written code or write additional code, and your changes won't be overwritten by the bot when you regenerate your project. So let's take a look at some protected regions. This here is what a protected region will look like in your code. And to use them, you just need to turn it on by changing this off keyword to an on word. And then you can add whatever you want inside, and this will be preserved whenever you regenerate the project. However, it is very important that you turn the protected regions on, as they will not work if they are turned off. Now, there are protected regions everywhere in the application. However, if you need a protected region somewhere that doesn't exist yet, you can follow this link in the readme to request new ones. Uh, the server side of the application is built using .NET and is responsible for handling data processing as well as other tasks like user management and security. So you can go to the server side section in the readme for information about .NET as well as instructions for how to run the server side. So for now, we're gonna jump into the server side code and when your application is built, there are a lot of contributing pieces of functionality, so we're going to go in and discuss them now. So within the server side, we have the following directories. Uh, we have assets, which contains the templates that are used for emails sent by your application. We have attribute validators, which contains classes which are used to filter incorrect values in entities before they're saved and updated in the database. We have configuration, which contains properties that are used throughout the server side and these can be updated in custom code in order to alter some behavior in the application to better suit your need. Then controllers contains all of the REST API endpoints for the application. Uh, enums contains implementations in C-sharp for any enum types which you added to your entity diagram. Uh, exceptions contains any implementations for custom exceptions that were used in the application and you can also define new exceptions in here if you need them. Uh, GraphQL contains all of the logic used to build the GraphQL schema for the application. Uh, helpers has classes which are used to implement a lot of utility methods that are used throughout the server-side application. And you can also add new helper classes to this directory when implementing custom code. Uh, migrations contains C-sharp implementations of any database migrations which might be required. Now, these migrations are automatically generated through .NET so you shouldn't need to make any changes to this directory while implementing custom code. Uh, models contain C-sharp classes which represent the entities that you've added to your application. 
Each entity has a class for the entity itself, as well as some configuration options, a database transfer class, and the type class, which is used for returning data from in GraphQL queries. Um, security, which defines the rules for which users can perform specific operations on different entity types. Uh, services contains classes that are used to perform important functions for the application, such as interacting with the database, and can be used in many places throughout the application code. And then we have utility, which serves a similar purpose to the helpers directory, as it contains helper methods which are used frequently in different areas of the application. Right. Uh, we'll be going into more depth on some of these directories soon, but hopefully this will help you get started and orient yourself while working with the server side. First up is your application's GraphQL classes. In this directory, schema.cs defines queries, which are used for accessing information, and mutations, which are used for modifying information. The other classes in this folder are all used to define the mutations and resolvers. As you can see here in the schema file, we create a query field and a mutation field for each entity in the application. There is also a method for both query and mutation, which defines the functions that exist as part of the schema. For example, in the query, we have functions for fetching the entity and for counting the entities, while in the mutation, we have methods for creating, updating, and deleting entities. These elements of the GraphQL schema are used in the data tables in the client side, so that they can interact with the database to fetch, create, update, and delete entities. The code for creating queries and mutations in the client side can be found here in the entity utils in the util directory. These methods take inputs for the necessary information for the queries, and then transform that information into GraphQL queries, which can then be sent to the server. Okay. Next up is the REST API endpoints. All of the REST endpoints can be found in the controllers directory in the server-side code. And the endpoints are split into different classes based on the functionality they offer or based on entity. As you can see here in this file, each entity has a lot of endpoints which can be used to access or manipulate the data. These include endpoints for fetching entities based on the ID or for creating entities as an example. However, there are many more which are created for this entity. The majority of the entity endpoints aren't used in the client side of the application by default, as GraphQL is used by the client side for interacting with the server. However, endpoints can be called from the client side using Axios, which is discussed more in the README, and can be used to make the data in your application available to other external users and applications. When you built your application on CodeBots, you would have defined security rules which stated which user entities were able to perform actions on any specific entity. The security directory in the server side contains code which ensures that those security rules are enforced. Similar ACL classes are generated on the client side and can be found here in the models folder. These ACL classes work very similarly to the ACLs in the server side. However, these ACLs are mostly used for determining access to routes within the client side. Permission for data database access is determined solely based on the server side ACLs. Uh, similar ACL classes are generated on the client side and can be found here in the models directory. These ACL classes work very similarly to the ACLs in the server side. However, these ACLs are primarily used for determining access to routes within the client side. Permission for database access is determined solely based on the server-side ACLs. The client side for your application is built using React and is responsible for displaying information to the users and interacting with the server in order to fetch or update information. Uh, within the client side, we have the models, which are React classes for the entities you added to your application. Uh, services, which by default only contains the security service that is responsible for client-side security logic. Uh, util, which contains classes that implement a lot of helper methods that are used throughout the client side. And validators, which contains implementations for validators used to filter bad inputs before they are sent to the client side. Uh, then we have tests, which contains the client side testing framework. And the testing framework is written using Jest and in Enzyme. And more information on these tools can be found in the testing technology list, which is linked in the unit test section of the readme. Then we have SCSS, which contains all of the styles for your application. And as you can see in here, the styles are split into front-end and admin, 
so you can style the front end and the admin sections differently. Okay, and then finally, all of the code which is used for displaying information to the user is found here in the views directory. Within this directory, there is a components directory which contains a lot of pre-built React components that you can use to build the pages in your application. Uh, there are too many here to go into detail with, but in the components section of the readme, there is a link to an article which explains them in greater detail. The export functionality allows for exporting entities from your database as a CSV file. This feature requires code in both the client side and the server side. The server side code for exporting can be found here in the controllers as each entity has a couple of API endpoints which are used for exporting entities based on conditions that are passed in. These endpoints are used by the client side to export the entities that are selected, and they can be used by external sites and users if your application security has been configured to allow this. Using the export endpoints from the client side can be done by hitting the endpoint using Axios. There is also a method here in the entity utils in the client side which implements this Axios call. And this method is used by data tables to export the entities selected by the user. Uh, your application comes with files which can be used to build and deploy your application. And instructions on how to use these files can be found in the readme document. In terms of the files, there is a docker compose file which contains all of the logic required to build static docker containers for your client side, server side and database. The environment variables which would be required when deploying your application using docker containers can be found in the docker.env file, and these environment variables can be updated to suit your needs. With your docker containers and your environment file, you should have everything you need to deploy your application using a hosting provider, and some common hosting providers are linked in the readme under the docker deployment section. Your application is built with Hangfire as a dependency, which allows you to define and execute scheduled tasks in your application. Scheduled tasks are handled by the background job service, which can be found here in the services directory in the server side. This service contains methods that you can call to begin scheduled tasks. An example of the, how these methods are used can be found in the user service here in the register user method, where a background job is started for sending confirmation emails to new users. Your project is configured to allow the server to send emails. This is done by using the email service, which can be found here in the services directory in the server side. Now, this service contains all of the logic which is required for sending emails to users. By default, the email service will send emails for registering a new user and for forgotten passwords. For an example of how this works, you can have a look at how it is implemented here in the user service, where the logic for sending registration emails is stored. New email templates can also be added to the assets folder if you plan to implement additional automated emails. The admin section of the client side allows users who have logged in as an administrator to access all of the entities in your application and gives them access to additional functionality that you may not want standard users to have. In the client side, most of the logic is shared between the front end and the admin section, whereas the code specific to rendering the admin section can be found here in the admin directory of the pages section of the client side. There are some pages here which are unique to the admin section like this admin home page component, which is like the home page for the admin section. Many of the pages are data tables for each of the entities in the application. These pages function very similarly to any counterpart data table in the client side. However, there will be one present for every entity instead of just the entities which have associated front end data tables. Um, the admin section of the site comes with a style guide page which displays the majority of the UI components that are implemented by the bot that you can add to your application. This page can be found here in the admin pages section again and shows you the code snippets which would be required to add the component to your UI. You can start up the site and go to this page in the admin section to see how each of these components look. And the route to the style guide can be found in the design system docs section of the client side. Your application contains functionality for registering new users. This involves the registration form in the client side, which allows visitors to register an account when accessing the site for the first time, and the API endpoints for registering the different user types in the application. The registration controller contains endpoints to register any of the user types that you added to the application, 
and can be found here in the controllers directory in the server side. Each endpoint has an annotation which is based on whether the user type can be created by visitors. So if the user can be created by visitors, then it will have an allow anonymous tag. And each of these endpoints will call the registration method, which then creates a user. In the client side, the registration logic is handled here in the registration page, which can be found in the pages directory of the views folder. Users can only be registered using the registration page if you have configured visitors to have create privilege for that user entity type. And the list of those user types can be found here in the registrable entities array. The registration page starts with a drop down to choose what type of user to register and then transitions to a traditional form once the selection has been made. Your application comes with endpoints and client side functionality for authenticating users who have previously been registered. Uh, the authorization controller, which is in the controllers directory of the server side, contains API endpoints for logging into the application and for logging out of the application. Whereas the client side contains a login class, which can be found here in the pages section of the client side. And this page contains the DOM structure for login and handles the logic for sending the request to the server side. And once that request has been completed and the login is successful, the login page also handles redirecting the authenticated user to the home page. The styling for your application is handled in the SCSS directory in the client side. And part of the styling is the theme of the application. Now, the theme of the application is generally defined by the color primary and color secondary variables, which are defined in this colors.scss file, which can be found in the abstracts directory of the front-end styles. All of the colors in the SCSS library are dependent on the colors in this file. So changing these colors allows you to change the colors across the entire application. And again, these styles are broken up into front-end and admin styles. So you can style the front-end and the admin section differently depending on your requirements. And the readme also contains more information and articles that you can use to get started customizing the look of your application. The file storage provider, Amazon S3, is integrated into your application. Information on how to use S3 in the application can be found in the Amazon S3 section of the readme. Now, as there are multiple potential file storage options which could be utilized in the application, there is a storage provider configuration class which is located here in the configuration folder of the server side. As different storage providers would require different code, this class allows you to define which provider is in use and define additional providers which can be used in the application by adding a field to this enum here. The implementation of file storage systems, including Amazon S3, can be found here in the file providers directory in the services folder. These classes all implement the upload storage provider interface and all have all of the methods required for the file provider to function properly. And you can also use a different storage provider by creating a new implementation for the storage provider interface and adding it to this directory and to the configuration class that we discussed earlier. The Swagger interface is a tool which allows you to examine the API endpoint structure of your application and to test API requests during development. And it will be present when your application is running in development mode. Swagger does not require any actual code in the application as it is added as a dependency to the server side. So for more information on how to access and use Swagger, you can examine the Swagger section of the readme. Graphical is a development tool which lets you build and test GraphQL queries and mutations and see how they will interact with your data. In the application, Graphical can be accessed through the home screen of the admin section or through the menu in the sidebar. Now, the Graphical page does not contain much logic as the functionality is provided by the Graphical dependency, but it requires some base logic which can be found here in the admin pages section. Your application has been built with a comprehensive testing framework that will help you ensure that any changes you make to the application do not break any existing bot written functionality. The majority of the testing framework can be found here in the test target directory and instructions on how to run each of the different types of tests can be found in the readme for each respective piece of the testing framework. The API tests for your application can be found in the test target under the API directory. As the name suggests, these tests will examine the API endpoints of your application. 
uh, within this directory, the actual tests are contained here in the tests folder. However, the API testing framework also contains a lot of additional classes which are used to implement the tests in this directory. The next part of the testing framework that we're going to talk about is unit tests. Now, the unit testing framework is split into the client-side and server-side unit tests. The client-side unit testing framework is built using Jest and Enzyme, which are discussed in the c -sharp bot technology list that is linked in the unit testing section of the readme. Now, these client-side tests all ensure that the individual components of the client-side are functioning as intended, and can be found here in the test directory of the client-side. The server-side component of the unit testing framework is located here in the test target under the server-side directory and contains unit tests for functionality in the application server-side. Now, part of the server-side tests is these mocking managers, which will let you mock specific actions for methods so that you can test the outcomes without having to follow the same sequence of events that would have to occur in standard use of the server. These Selenium tests can be found here in the test folder. Now, the tests take the form of feature files which describe the actions which are being taken for each stage of the test. Each of the sentences in the feature file is linked with a step definition, which can be found in one of the classes here in the steps directory. The step definitions execute code for the steps to interact with the site. Now, in order to simplify interactions with the site, the bot writes page objects models. These models can be found here in the page object directory, and they implement functions to interact with each of the UI elements on the page. So for example, in this CRUD entity page object contains elements for each of the buttons on the page, and these elements can be used to simulate clicking that button. Okay, that is pretty much it. So that is CodeBots. Now, I hope that this was simple and straightforward enough for you to understand. And if this has been interesting to you, please let us know by commenting below. And if you have any questions or comments, please use the comment section or hit us up on Twitter at HelloCodeBots. Thank you.